I was asked to talk about what questions do I ask and why. This is a very important topic, um, is as we evaluate patients, we want to make sure that the, uh, the patients uh, are good candidates uh, for microsurgery that they are, they are looking for. My disclosure, a textbook on lymphedema surgery. So um, two things I want to find out. Just, does a patient have lymphedema? Patients often come and see me or other surgeons and they have a swollen arm and the leg. They, they think they have lymphedema, but they may not. So it's important for us to know whether they have lymphedema. And also, second thing that I want to find out is, is the patient, if she or he has a lymphedema, uh, are they a reasonable candidate for microsurgical uh, procedure for lymphedema? So what are the questions that I ask to uh, answer these two uh, questions? So I often ask them, how do you know you have lymphedema? And many of them say, well, so-and-so told me I have lymphedema. Or I looked it up in the internet and I think I have lymphedema. Uh, but we know that not all swelling of arms or legs are lymphedema, right? There are many, many causes of the swelling. So I know there are many of you here are therapists. Some of you are uh, doctors here. Do you think this patient has lymphedema? How many people think she has lymphedema? So she doesn't, right? So as Dr. Slaver mentioned, some patients will say, you know, I banged my leg one day, and then next day I, had, I, I developed lymphedema. They often say that, and I will say, well, that's probably not the cause of your lymphedema. Uh, it, did it just happen just one day spontaneously? Uh, uh, when did it happen? Uh, did you travel anywhere? Did you go to Southeast Asia? Did you go to Africa? Those, those are important questions for us to have, those who, who live in the United States, for the reasons I talk about. Did you have any surgery? to your lymph node basin. Did you have breast cancer? Did you have a pelvic surgery for uh, uh, radical hysterectomy, melanoma? Uh, did you have a radiation? These are all the questions that I ask to identify the cause of lymphedema. Because you could have primary lymphedema, which a lot of people don't know, that, uh, that could occur uh, during the different times of uh, your life. It could be in your infancy, during your childhood, or even as an adult. Now, most common cause of uh, lymphedema in the United States and most of the Western country is the secondary to the treatment that the doctors provide uh, to them for treatment of cancer, removing the lymph nodes or radiation. But in the worldwide, it's the parasite, fluoriasis. So I always ask these, and there are a few patients uh, from time to time who say, well, I've traveled here and there, and uh, then I will get a, get a test to see if they have fluoriasis. There's an antigen test you can get, and if there is, then you've got to treat that with antibiotic. I mean, I've been doing, treating, uh, doing lymphedema surgery now since about 2005. I, I have not seen anybody with fluoride yet. Personally, I know some of my colleagues have, but I have not seen it yet. Uh, there are a number of people that I have sent a blood test for. But it's a huge problem if you go outside the United States. Uh, and another thing that I want to know is uh, how long have you lymphedema? Is it just for a few months or has it been a few years? We know that uh, sometimes patients who have had uh, radiation or uh, lymph node removal, for temporarily, they could have swelling uh, temporarily uh, for a few months, and sometimes it just goes away. So uh, we need to know that. I need to know whether they have lymphedema for 10 years, 20 years. In general, in most patients, although it's not true for everybody, uh, I think there's this general progression of lymphedema, it, uh, and it can lead to irreversible structure changes, as we know, into fibrosis and uh, atrophy of smooth muscle cells. So I think knowing how long they have lymphedema is important information. This is a study that uh, Dr. Koshima uh, from Yuzha Tokyo had done a number of years ago, looking at the uh, cross-section of lymphatic vessels, demonstrating that in patients with lymphedema, uh, there are actually uh, cellular damages that occur at the smooth muscle level, and there is the lymphatic vessels will uh, undergo these changes. And now that, we, that I'm doing lymphatic surgery all the time, I see all these different phases of lymphatic vessels. I have found lymphatic vessels which are healthy, healthy looking with the smooth muscle contracting lymphatic fluid. And then I see some lymphatic vessels that are like kind of cobblestones trying to ha have some damage. And there's some lymphatic vessels that are, you, when you cut it, there's no fluid at all. It's completely like a, just a solid tube. And those are not functioning lymphatic vessels. Uh, and then I ask, how was it diagnosed? Uh, some patients have had lymphocentigraphy, but many have not. If they have developed spontaneous swelling of the limb, and I don't know exactly what the cause is, 
then I will get a lymphocentigraphy. It's important for me to see if they have normal lymphocentigraphy or have normal lymphocentigraphy. When I started doing the surgery uh, early on, I used to get this on pretty, pretty much all the patients. But now, if they come in with a clear uh, history of uh, lymph node removal and radiation, I don't get them because you know, and then uh, uh, on, on all those patients. Now, many patients are getting different types of imaging studies, such as uh, MRI. Uh, as um, some institutions, if, so if they have them, I will ask them to bring them. Um, and then, of course, we ask for family history. You know, uh, does anybody else in your family have a, a lymphedema? Uh, do you have a history of a venous uh, surgery to your uh, arm or legs? Uh, do you have history of DVT, uh, hypercoagulability? These two questions are pertinent for those of us who do microsurgery because. Uh, if patients are prone to developing uh, clotting, then the doing a free flap like, such as lymph node transplant or lymphovenous bypass may not be a good idea. And then the medications that, that they take. Um, Dr. Slavin mentioned this, BMI. I always weigh them. I, I have a BMI chart in every room so I can show the patients. Patients don't like to be told they're obese, so I just show them where they are in the BMI chart. And I will say, well, this is your BMI. I'm not, I don't use the word obesity. Uh, this is your BMI. The, this is your target BMI. So for you, for five foot four, you need to be down at this weight for us to consider you for surgery. Uh, but another thing you have to remember is that sometimes just because of their leg is huge, that could be the cause of the BMI. So you have to kind of look at the whole body and see where the BMI is. Is it generalized obesity or is it because of the lymphedema? I ask about their lifestyle. You know, what do you, what kind of work do you do? Do you stand all day on your feet, uh, walking around your waitress? Um, what kind of exercise do you do? Uh, do you do powerlifting? Do you do aerobics, yoga? Do you do swimming? Um, have you gained a lot of weight recently? Have you lost weight? Um, and some of the patients have uh, had treatment for lymphedema, and I ask, what have you had? What have you done so far to treat lymphedema? So. It is very important that all the patients have it, seen a lymphedema therapist uh, at some point. If they have never seen anyone or they haven't seen anyone in a number of years and really haven't done anything, first thing I do is uh, make sure they're hooked up with uh, a good lymphedema therapist and have all the regimens and educations that are necessary to treat lymphedema. It is very important. Even if they have surgery, they still have to take, have these things done. Uh, so it is important they do this. And I'll hook them up. I ask about their garment. How often do you wear it? How old is it? Some people have had a garment for like four or five years and never changed it. And uh, it's just not effective anymore. And how often do you get it? I hear some pe patients come in and say, oh, I just buy them uh, online myself. And uh, I said, then, well, you should probably get it measured and have somebody guide you to, to make sure it's the right type of garment for you. Um, and then we talk about uh, what kind of thing are you doing? Are you wearing those oven mitts at night? Are you... Are you uh, using the pump? All those things, uh, I want to find out where they are, how compliant they are. Um, and some people have had surgery. Uh, they've had uh, uh, bypasses or lymph node transplants elsewhere, liposuction. So obviously I need to know about that. And then I ask them, what do you know about the treatment? A lot of patients actually know quite a bit. Nowadays with the uh, internet, they all go in online, they're all talking to other patients. So they know a lot. But as Dr. Slavin mentioned, a lot of them might be a myth and may be a wrong information. So it's very important for me to clarify that the information they have uh, is uh, uh, accurate. And then I talk about all these different options. These are the options, these are the surgical procedures that I personally perform. So I talk about them, pros and cons of each, what to expect, and uh, uh, what are potential complications you could expect. Um, and currently, this is kind of a general guideline of what my, my approach is. And if patients have mild lymphedema, maybe you can just do lymphovenous bypass. Uh, if otherwise, uh, you may need to do lymph node transplant, you may need to combine all, uh, both of them. And I would say majority of my cases uh, are where the patients would, uh, I think, would benefit from combination of both procedures. So I do a lot of com combination procedures nowadays, but there are some patients who may only benefit from uh, one or the other. So we talk about this, and of course I talk about whether in severe cases uh, there's no other choice but to debulk, really. You can't really do any microsurgery and expect you to get any kind of reasonable result. And then liposuction is another thing that's been very uh, 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 commonly performed, and Dr. Barroso will talk more about that, but there's a, a role for that as well. 
And as we talked about the different myth, some people think that, uh, that if you do this surgery, it will cure the lymphedema. Or they've heard or somebody told them. And I tell them, at least for me, I cannot do it. I cannot cure your lymphedema. And I will tell them that though, most people, most patients who have, who have undergone the surgery and the regimen, it seems to improve them, but not everybody. And it seems to improve their complications related lymphedema, such as cellulitis. Uh, and in most patients, it does improve quality of life. But I do tell them, not everybody. To me, it's like a bell curve. So there's one extreme of patients where they do very well, very well, and there's extreme of patients on the other end who, who don't benefit at all, but the most patients are somewhere in the middle getting some benefit. And, uh, and I talk about complications, uh, such as even if you take lymph nodes, you may get a secondary lymphedema, you can get lymphatic leak. Uh, all those things are very important for patients to know, and I'm very upfront about that. And uh, some probably are scared away by it. And I tell them it's evolving, that I've been doing this for now over 10 years, but my technique has changed, and we are studying and we are learning, and then we continue to change our approach. And uh, there are still many questions. Uh, I talk about financial factor. Um, you know, so all my patients, um, what we do is if they want a surgery, I submit it to insurance, and once they are approved, then I schedule for surgery. Uh, there are very few patients who pay out of pocket. A lot, they, often they cannot. The people or patients that I see, they're not cosmetic surgical patients. They're coming for reconstruction. So uh, we talk about that, it could be, a, it could be a, a problem, but it's getting a lot better. Dr. Slaver mentioned the reimbursement for some of this work, very, very technically demanding, is very, very low. Uh, so currently there's no ideal solution. Uh, so these are the things that I talk to patients about. And uh, thank you very much.